Welcome to the eighth episode in a series where I'm trying to make high quality PCBs using a cheap CNC router. In the last episode, we finally got some promising results and made what I think was a pretty good looking PCB. This episode will look to improve one of the more fiddly parts of that process, specifically setting up and aligning the origin for the mill and the laser. Now I did have a pretty good automatic process for probing the origin of the mill, but it turns out to be not all that accurate really. But for the laser, it's the other way around. The method I am using is pretty accurate, but it's all very manual and takes a bit of time to set up. So my concept is to have a common sensor block for the mill and the laser, mostly with an automated setup. Now when I'm designing stuff, I always try to identify key components first and test them in isolation. In this case, the sensing method is clearly key. So I'm starting off by testing using this LED as a sensor for the laser. Now the idea to use a LED as a sensor was simulated from a video I saw from Steve Mould, where he talks about how LEDs and solar panels are pretty much interchangeable. Well, not really interchangeable, but they can serve each other's functions. So what you see me using in this test here is actually a vintage era ultra bright LED that I had on hand from, I don't know, 30 years or so ago. Sadly, some of the more recent El Cheapo LEDs did not really provide enough voltage for this test to be usable. As you can see, when illuminated by the laser on its weakest setting, I'm getting around about 1.5 volts. So that's enough to switch on a transistor for sure. Testing with an NPN transistor shows it works pretty well and provides a good swing between zero and five volts. Now I did notice a linear change in brightness relative to the proximity, but as I'll be using a Schottky logic gate, it should still give a nice solid detection point. For the mill, I'm also going for a non-contact method using a two millimeter probe and an off-the-shelf optical interrupt sensor. I've used this before, so no surprises here, and it works well with a solid voltage swing. So here's the original scribble for my design, nothing complicated. Just get each of the sensors to a logic level voltage and then awe them all together. For the output side, I'll use an optocoupler to send the signal to the CNC. And I've also added a local LED indicator so you can see what's going on. Now for the power, I was planning to use a couple of CR2032 lithium batteries and a voltage regulator. And that didn't work at all, so I actually changed that later. Here are all the components that I'm planning to use. I was actually thinking to install all of them on that little bit of green prototype board you can see there. But later on, I realized it would be just better to make a PCB. So here's everything installed on the breadboard for testing. And here's the power supply solution that I came up with in the end. The rechargeable cell is actually salvaged from a dead anchor mobile battery. The battery holder, USB-C charger and voltage boost modules are all from AliExpress. Desktop testing showed the opto interrupt sensors working as expected. So the basic circuit should be fine. I also tested the opto coupler to make sure it would trigger the CNC correctly. And yep, that worked fine too. Next up, testing the sensor for the laser. Something I did notice here is that the detection LED appeared to fade in and out instead of a hard switch on or off. And that didn't seem right. And as this is a digital circuit, the fade effect must be caused by some sort of high frequency pulsing. And sure enough, checking as AC voltage confirmed this was the case with a frequency of around about one megahertz being detected. So what I expect is happening in here is that the sensing LED is effectively charging up and dumping the power into the transistor in bursts. And of course, with more light applied, these bursts become longer in duration. Now it's a little bit different to what I originally expected, but it's easy enough to fix. This is done by adding a capacitor to save a more substantial charge before the transistor actually switches on, and then a resistor is used to slow the actual discharge speed. And with all that installed, we now see a solid switch on and off behavior from the sensor. And looking at the multimeter also, we can see that the high frequency oscillation has now also gone. So now on to making the PCB. Here is the final design drawn up in KiCad. It has just one small change from the original design. Instead of using a PNP transistor to invert the opto interrupt signal, I'm now using one of the unused NAND gates. So that saved a couple of parts. Actually, the first PCB turned out to be a bit of a disaster. So let me share some of the pain with you. For the etching, my first mistake was to attempt to lower the laser power a bit. And the second was being careless with the design of the burn paths. All this resulted in a lot of unwanted resin lines, which I had to manually remove. Also, my new configuration for removing the resin from the pads was another big fail. Seems like a never ending story really. At first, with the naked eye, it looked pretty much as I had expected, seemingly only requiring a second pass. But under the microscope, I could see heaps of tiny resin lines. But these were only on pads cleared with the vertical path. Horizontally cleared pads seemed fine. Now the reason for this is something that I'd already sort of noticed, but not given much thought to. The shape of the beam is in fact not a circle, but elliptical, being a little bit wider than it is tall. Actually, after thinking about this, I remembered seeing a laser lithography experiment done by Breaking Taps, where he specifically points out this issue for these cheap laser diodes. Anyway, just running the G-code again would not clear these pads in this case. So in the end, I ended up just manually scraping them all off. It's really not much fun. 
but at least my first attempt at cutting and using a stencil for applying the solder paste was mostly a success, but seemingly too little solder was applied, so next time I'm going to have to use a bit of a thicker stencil. I used a heat gun this time to heat the underside of the board and melt the solder, which sort of worked, but it also ended up warping the board a bit, likely due to inconsistent heating. I also noticed that some types of components, such as capacitors and LEDs, floated off a bit under the surface tension of the solder as the solder paste would actually melt. Now I found some special and pretty expensive heat activated glue intended for surface mount components, so I'm planning to give that a go at some point in the future. In any case, all of these problems discussed so far are really not all that critical. A little bit of annoying, but easy enough to work through. But sadly, that was not the case for this next issue. Put simply, the board would just not work properly after I made it, and there was really no rhyme or reason as to why that would be the case. Effectively, the centers were simply stuck on all the time. After checking, I found that something was overcoming the bias from the pull-up resistors of the sensors, resulting in an output of around about 1 volt instead of the 5 volts that it should have been. So I proceeded to strip off all of the components on the board to isolate the offending circuit, but even with nothing visibly connected to the trace anymore, I still measured around about a 2 kilo ohm resistance going to ground, which is clearly more than enough to overcome the 47 kilo ohm pull-up resistor I was using. After staring at the PCB blank face for a while, it finally dawned on me that the only thing now bridging between this trace and ground was the actual white text. So I proceeded to scrape off the white text from the affected area, and you wouldn't believe it, it actually fixed the problem. So as you can see in the diagram, basically that ground plane is surrounding the the pad there and around that we have those lines so undoubtedly it's going to be shorting to the ground so we have the ground pin here and if i check the resistance here for example it's yeah, 6k so basically we have a 6k resistor going between the ground plane and that pin there and this is a little bit different over here 2.5k which is even worse all right so let's knock out those two little lines hopefully i can get a good angle and I actually made a mistake when I was cleaning up one of the other locations where I actually cut the track. It's just such fidgety work. Now when I knock out the white resin, I'm actually knocking out... The white resin sort of clung to the, the burnt resin, burnt residue that is underneath there. So it actually takes away the, the problem area at the same time. So it's not... You know, I don't think that the white resin is being conductive. I'm pretty sure it's going to be that burnt residue. Alright, so let's have a look what we got. Look at that, open circuit. Perfect. So those two little lines, well it's two, it's, a, yeah, it's one line that's crossing the two sides of the ground plane. They're actually providing enough of a connection to give a 2.5k ohm resistor. I mean, that's really insane. It's quite interesting though. I mean, I mean in this case it's, it's a problem, but effectively what we're doing is by burning a bit of resin between two traces on the board is creating a resistor. So, you know, with a little bit of experimentation it's probably even possible to use that technique to actually make components out of the resin on the board, which might even make it some sense in some circumstances. But in any case, that might be a project for the future. For now it's just a bit of a problem that I have to overcome. So of course the white UV resin is not becoming conductive or it's not conductive or anything like that. It is actually the green UV resin mask which I'm using, which I'm burning with a laser, and it's actually turning into a conductive path. Actually I remember seeing a Lewis Rossman repair video once where one of his staff clearly stated that all burnt resin must be removed from a repair site as it becomes conductive when burnt. In hindsight, clearly that was great advice. So obviously the method for burning the slots in the resin and then embedding the white resin you clearly can't use that in any place where that it would actually bridge any of the traces. And naturally that's going to make it a pretty difficult process to use for these really tiny boards where we really don't have space to move around the text so it doesn't bridge any of those traces. Ultimately it means I'm going to have to come up with a new way to lay this text without actually burning slots into the resin. And as for this first board, well after wasting a good part of a day trying to clear away all of those unwanted bridges, scratching at the board and <laughs> damaging the tracks and repairing tracks and trying to get it to work, Finally, I just gave up on it as a lost cause. Sometimes you really just gotta know when to quit. So on to making another PCB. I updated the board design a bit, primarily to get rid of all of those silly residual resin lines we saw before, but I also added better isolation around the optocoupler output, just for good measure. With the laser power back to the original settings, the burn and etching result was really very good this time around. Coating of the finished resin layer also went very nicely. And there's a little bit of a knack to that, so practice clearly makes perfect with this process. I also came up with another plan for clearing the resin from the pads, 
Actually, this time I slowed down the feed speed and also dropped the power levels. It's a little bit counterintuitive, but my idea is that slowing things down a bit will give the pads more time to dissipate the heat applied, and hopefully I will also get a wider burn path. After the first burn and clean, it looks pretty good, with just a nice thin and even resin coat remaining. A second run with the same setting seems to remove most of the remaining resin. It's not perfect, requiring some manual touch-up here and there, but definitely an improvement compared to my last effort. Interestingly enough, these wider residual resin lines that remain are actually a result of play within the XY gantry of the CNC. Now for some mysterious reason, Flatcam actually makes G-code paths that do not complete these larger pads all in one go. So when the laser leaves and then returns back to finish off the pad, we get these wider lines remaining. So one of the issues I did manage to cross off the list this time was cleaning of the pads. It turns out that simple metal polish does actually do the trick. And as long as the solder pads become fully shiny, you can be confident that they will take up solder pretty well. Here you can see some final manual cleanup of some of the larger pads. So as I said, the clearing process is still a working process. And here is the finished result with everything looking very nice indeed. So this is my first attempt at a new method to add the white text overlay. I used the silk screen to lay a coat of white past curing resin first, and then I used the laser to expose the areas that I want to keep. Washed the excess off with IPA, and actually I was pretty surprised and relieved to see it working on the first try. I had to scrub pretty hard to get off all of the excess, and the laser power is clearly too high, causing some overexposure and blurred lines. But all in all, it was a pretty promising test, I think. To finish up, I give it about 30 seconds in the UV exposure just to lock everything in. As for the drilling, unsurprisingly, using the old probing method, I still need to make some manual adjustments to get the drill in the center of the pads. Again, I cut out the stencil for the solder paste using the CNC, but this time I stuck three sheets of label paper together instead of just two, and that gave me around about 0.21 millimeters of thickness. Cutting this amount of paper with a laser surprisingly needs a lot of power. Here I was actually using 55%, which was still a little bit underpowered. So next time I'll probably go as high as 60%. I also bought this cheap $25 Panasonic iron and I made a mounting base for it out of scrap wood to hold it in place. I'm pretty sure this is gonna be a much better solution for heating the PCBs, but the heat control is pretty rough with the simple thermostat. So I'm actually thinking to add a computerized thermostat to this. You can see me using this setup for the first time to salvage all of the components from the old PCB. And you can see it works pretty well too. All right, time for a time lapse. And there you go, all the surface mount components are all nicely installed. Let's get some heat into that sucker and see how it goes. The iron is already at temperature here, so I'm going to show you this all in real time so you can see how quickly this goes. Those capacitors and LEDs are behaving much better this time around likely because we've already sold it once before. And there you go, all done, super quick. It looks like using the thicker stencil also gave just the right amount of solder. There's a good amount of coverage and the solder pads had no problem at all taking up the solder. So it looks like the polishing is working pretty good too. I did notice that this solder paste does leave a few little solder beads here and there, and sometimes they're not so easy to clean off. I'm planning to try a different solder paste next time, 183 degree instead of 138 degree. With any luck, the behavior will be a little bit different in this regards. 
And as you can see here, the capacitor has floated off a little bit out of position. So hopefully when we get the red glue, that's going to solve that too. The through pin components are all manually soldered. But before I show you that, I need to show you this out of sequence bit first. Hopefully it doesn't confuse anyone. Before the LED for the laser sensor is installed, I actually need to make tiny slots in the bottom of the optical interrupt sensors. But in this case, I'd already actually made those slots in these sensors when making that first PCB. So for this second PCB, I'm actually just installing everything at the same time, which is not really the correct order. Here you can see how the slots were cut in the bottom of the X and Y axis interrupt sensors. And only after that can the LED, being used for the laser sensor, be installed. Alrighty, time for one last quick time lapse. And there you go. Finally everything installed on the CNC, ready to run. You can see that I've mounted the battery to the side of the wasteboard there. Effectively the sensor, battery and wasteboard all act together as one single unit. To do the alignment, I created two separate G-code sequences, one for the mill alignment and one for the laser alignment. Now I could probably assign these to preset buttons in Candle, if I had any spare that is. But since I don't, in this case I'm actually just loading them manually from a file. Let's run the sequence for the mill first. First the CNC will home itself. Then we need to put the Pi probe in place and press the pause button to continue. After that we need to move the probe connections to the sensor module. And then we press the pause button again so the sequence can complete itself. First the probe is the Y axis. And then it probes the X axis. Here I'm showing the completion sequence, which has a final confirmation step. Actually, later I remove that step to save a bit of time. Probing for the laser is fundamentally the same order of operation, but there are a few little differences in the file for the support of the laser. Now to get the mill and laser working in exactly the same origin alignment, the offsets in either the mill or the laser G-code probe sequence must be modified. In my case, I modified the mill's G-code file. So these are the little wooden test group ones that I made to do the testing and alignment. After setting up the mill and running the probing sequence, holes are drilled in a somewhat random pattern at known coordinates, of course. Then the laser is installed and its probing sequence run to get it in position. And after that, I follow up by burning a cross pattern at the same coordinates of those holes. By doing this, I could check how far the alignment was out and step by step make small adjustments as need be until the alignment was just right. Yeah, this is the pre-alignment one that I've done here and you can see 
the mill is a little bit below, quite a lot below the, uh, the laser here. And the top of the mill here is really on the center line here. And if we look at the next one here, see if I can find it, we're actually a little bit above the line. So this difference here, which is around about maybe 0 0.05 millimeters, this is the play uh, in the in the XY axis of the uh, CNC. So, so we can see a little bit of the play. It may not just be the play; it could also be the way that the uh, the run out of the mill is actually uh, causing the holes to be in a slightly different position. But in any case, we can see that they're all pretty much consistently in a similar sort of position. And after the first alignment, I've got it to look somewhat like this. And the holes are a little bit ugly there. So a little bit above, still pretty centered, but not perfect. And I actually fiddled around with this quite a lot until I got it right. I, I think I didn't really have a good mental process. And the reason is because there's a lot of different variation. There's some, the play in the CNC that sort of moves the holes around. There's the fact that the, the mill and it's run out and might drop the holes a little bit different. So it's sort of really hard to figure out if the misalignment is because of those factors or because of the position of the alignment of the sensor itself. I ended up fiddling around with that for around about, I think this is the last one that I had, the 12th test. And by that time I'd got it looking pretty good. I think overall, on average, even with all the different positions, you can see they look pretty close. So that's number 12 number 12 and this is number uh, 11 and if we look at number 11 we can also see that it looks pretty good it looks pretty much the same right so the I actually did three runs at this setting and they all gave the same results so that tells me that we can take the laser out and the mill out and reinstall all of the mill bits all of the bits and pieces and still come back and get the same position pretty much three times in a row so you know that's a pretty good sign that the sensor is doing its job quite well i wanted to get a bit of an idea if these variations really were a factor of the mills run out or a factor of some sort of variation caused by the sensor's performance so what i did is i left the laser installed and i re-ran the alignment three times in a row and each time i reburnt the same laser pattern to see if the position would remain in the same location and the answer is is it did it looks really really good i don't see any misalignment or change in alignment after each realignment sessions. But what this tells me is that the optical alignment mechanism and the way that the alignment is being measured in the CNC's firmware is giving a very accurate and consistent result. So that was a relief. So there you have it. And that should be pretty much it for this video, but it would be a bit of a letdown if I didn't test this new probing method for actually making a PCB. So that's exactly what I did. And here it is. So let's take a look at this new board I just made. And the idea was to test the center alignment. So I'm not doing any manual post alignment. This is 100% only using that sensor to align the mill and the laser and just running it blind. I didn't even check it. I just hit the button and, and, and ran it. And on the back side here, we can see that it looks sort of pretty good. And as we run around to these other here, we see that they sort of fling off to the left a little bit. So that's obviously something mechanical. It's not to do with the sensor itself. And that's also quite evident when you look at the front side uh, because these holes are really quite on elongated. You can see here that the way that it sort of entered and then sort of wallowed around there and dropped in is, is quite bizarre and all of this tearing around the top here. So it looks like the basic position of the hole is probably, looks like it's probably meant to be here, which would be correct or pretty correct. Um, and all of this is just the wallowing. So I suspect that the mill bit is actually looking a bit blunt because the original versions of this board we did didn't actually have this degree of wallowing. So, and with the combined very fast Z axis feed speed is sort of slamming here and then bouncing around and then sort of getting back into position. So anyway, it's not a great test because of uh, the environment, but I think there's enough evidence here to prove that the, the the sensor is doing its job and it's actually getting the alignment pretty right. The other thing that I was testing was trying to getting these pads cleared using a new technique and I purposefully even got rid of the little heat sinking legs here to try to make it a little bit of a harder task. But the reality is, is the new method I used actually failed. You can see that this is all sort of puffing up here and these small 0603 pads without any real, I mean they're tiny in themselves and then they've only got a very tiny uh, track coming off them. They're also 
looking pretty dubious, I would say. This one here, which has got a big fat line, looking good. Obviously, one of the, the tricks you can do, and I think it's not a bad idea, and maybe I'll give it more attention, is just to make sure you have on some of these smaller pads or these standalone pads, just to make sure you do have some heat sinking capability. You know, in my mind, I don't want to be dependent on the design to clear the pads, which is why I'm searching for the the ideal setting that means I don't have to worry about the design. But at the end of the day, I, it might actually be unavoidable. You might actually have to pay some attention to the design to, to clear with this method. The other thing I was testing uh, with this new board was trying to dial in my updated method for laying this white text. And in the sensor board, it was a little bit overexposed, so I was trying to dial it down a little bit, but I think I haven't dialed it down quite enough. This was running at around about two exposure runs at uh, 2%, if I remember correctly. So those look a little bit messy. So what I'll do is I'll go down to 1.5%, two runs at 1.5%. That will make the, uh, the size of the laser dot even smaller and stop the effect of bleeding. So with all that, where are we with this cheap CMC PCB making methodology? Well, I need to do some tweaking and some testing to get the pad clearing and text overlay a little bit better. But I think this is really just a matter of time. I don't see any roadblocks here with that process. I also get the impression that this new probe sensor I made is more of a convenience than a must have. Don't get me wrong, the convenience benefit alone is not insubsequential, but really only if the precision of the CNC is improved could we expect the full accuracy benefit. So can you really make high resolution and high quality PCBs with a minimally modified cheap CNC? Well for me at least, the answer is unequivocally yes. It has exceeded all of my expectations. But let's also take a minute to critically look at the limitations of this cheap CNC. The first one is, the wire platform is really weak and it can sink easily causing unwanted z-axis deviations. The second one is that the x-axis is also weak and it can twist causing unwanted y and z-axis deviations. The third one is, the X and Y axis lead screws do have backlash management, but we still see a play of around about 0.03 millimeters. For the fourth one, the Z axis lead screws don't appear to have any backlash management at all, or possibly mine is broken, I'm not really sure. In any case, I'm seeing a play of around about 0.5 millimeters, yeah, half a millimeter, which is crazy. And the final issue, which is probably not so big for PCB making, number five, is that the clearance of the Z axis is pretty limited, really. Now, if all of these issues are addressed, one could expect you would probably get a lot more performance out of this little CNC. But is it really necessary for making PCBs like this? Well, not really. Would it be expensive? Meaning it's no longer a cheap CNC? Well, maybe, I guess. Doing some research showed me that maybe for a bit under $100, I can probably fix or at least greatly improve most of these problems. Or at least I think so, anyway. So parts are already on order, and I will definitely provide an update as I implement all of those fixes. Anyway, if you've made it this far, do me a solid one and consider hitting that like or subscribe button. God, this is the same thing that everyone says at the end of the video. Anyway, leave a comment. Anything like that is going to help these videos reach other people too. So for my next video, I'm not sure as usual as to what it might be. Surprisingly, some of my Arduino programming videos are actually watched by people. So I guess it might be about time for another one of those too. I also have a huge backlog of maker projects too. So hopefully plenty of interesting stuff coming up soon. In any case, no matter what it might be, I do hope you can spare a moment to join me and check it out. So see you then.